Ladies and gentlemen, we have the distinct privilege of sitting down today with a true financial luminary, a man whose name is synonymous with investing wisdom and global insight. He's an acclaimed author, a renowned investor, and a lifelong adventurer in the world of finance. With a career spanning decades and a unique perspective on the global economy, he's none other than the legendary Jim Rogers. Join us as we delve into his extensive knowledge, experiences, and his thoughts on the ever-evolving landscape of global finance. Let us welcome Ed Sedell, the retirement trainer, and Jim Rogers. Welcome to the podcast. And uh, I, you, you know, I, I have so many questions for you. You have led such a storied life, um, you know, and I'm not just talking about the financial world. Um, I, one of the things that I think people that uh, uh, don't know a whole lot about is the trip that you took around the world on a motorcycle. Um, what made you want to, because I love to ride. I mean, that's, you know, that's always been a big part of my life. So that to me, that's, uh, uh, that's fascinating. So what made you want to do it? And uh, uh, what did you, uh, what'd you learn from it? Well, Ed, I, I, I've, I grew up in a very small place in the backwoods of Alabama. My phone number was five and you either never leave there or you want to get out and see the world. I was one of those who wanted to see the world. I wanted adventure. I wanted to do it all and do as much as I could. So I retired young in order to try to see the world. I went around the world once on a motorcycle uh, for two years. And then I spent a few years later, I did it again, only in a car for three years. So I have spent five years of my life driving around the world. You might say I wasted five years of my life, but I loved every minute of it. Uh, yeah, well, I wouldn't say it was a waste. I think it probably gave you perspective, you know, through all the cultures, everything, you, you know, all of your experiences um, and, and even trying to get the visas and permission to go from one through one country to, to another had to be uh, a learning, you know, experience in and of itself. Well, there is no question. It's not so easy doing all of this. You have to have vaccinations, you have to have visas, you have to have permission, you have to get across the borders. There are many problems in going around the world. I mean, this is not driving over to Los Angeles for the weekend or something. This is a lot of problems and a lot of fun. So when you did it, I mean, did you have, uh, so on the motorcycle, I, obviously in the car, it's a little bit different and easier because on, on a motorcycle, you know, um, it's uh, you, you've got to carry uh, uh, a lot less with you because uh, a lot less room. So, I mean, how did you, uh, wh what did you come up with to figure out what you needed to take? And, and did you switch out going from uh, country to country, climate to climate, season to season? Well, first of all, on a motorcycle, you cannot take a nap if you need a nap. <laughs> uh, and you pull over the side of the road, or you, unless you're crazy. And so you can take a nap. But in a car, you can take a nap if you have another driver. So cars have advantages and disadvantages. But my goal was to see as much as I could of the world, uh, for better or for worse. And it was great. Now, what you take, you cannot take as much on a motorcycle as you can in a car, needless to say. But either way, you don't need it a lot. I mean, I know people think, oh, God, I'll be gone for a year or two. I've got to take a lot of stuff. No, you don't. You, there's a laundry everywhere. You get to a hotel room. The first thing you do is send stuff to the laundry, for instance. <laughs> so we took what we needed. If we needed something else, we could buy it always, of course. But you don't need a lot, believe it or not. Uh, if you go to a country and the queen invites you to dinner, don't worry. She knows you're riding around the world on a motorcycle. She knows you don't have your tuxedo with you. It, you can get a, get along quite fine. So, what was uh, what was the 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 best experience that that you had riding the motorcycle? The, your first time around the world. Is, is well, there the best experience count? was every day. You know, you you open the door if you live in Chicago or something. You pretty much know what's going to happen every day when you open your front door. But when you're going around the world, Ed, every day, you don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now. You might be dead. You might meet a goddess. Who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> and that's, for me, part of the excitement. 
Oh, that's awesome. Um, well, you know, when when we uh, uh, started uh, uh, the podcast, uh, you said that it's 9 p.m. where you're at right now, middle of the night. So um, you're in Singapore and you live in Singapore. Um, so what made you want to move to, to Singapore? Because that's that's where you reside now, right? Yes, yes, we live in Singapore. Well, I had a child and all for many years, I've been telling people before I had children, and telling everybody you should teach your children and grandchildren Chinese. Then I had one. Oh my gosh, what do I do now? We were teaching her. She was growing up speaking good Mandarin in New York, but it became clear that if I was serious, that I had to take her to a place, to a city where she had to speak Chinese. She came home from the park one day in New York crying because everybody spoke Spanish like their, like their nannies. And they laughed at her because she spoke Chinese. So I realized that if we were serious. We had to take her to a place where she had to speak Mandarin. The cities in China were and still are polluted. So Singapore, they don't speak. I mean, they don't. it's not polluted. They speak English and Chinese. So it seemed perfect. So, so why was China uh, important? I mean, learning Chinese. I mean, were you looking at something down the road and, and just to kind of yeah, give uh, options or opportunities, or, or what What was the reasoning for that? Well, for many years, I've been trying to explain to people that China was going to be an extremely important country in the 21st century. I think nearly everybody knows that now. I'm not the only one, but that was the reason. I wanted to prepare her, them, there are now two of them, them for the 21st century. I wanted them to speak perfect Mandarin, and English, the English is no problem, obviously, but now they speak perfect Chinese and perfect English. It's not going to make them successful, Ed. They might wind up terrible failures, but at least they have a leg up in the beginning. Right. All right. So, I mean, you kind of saw what was coming down the road as far as China becoming a world power. Um, you know, with, with all of the issues, the geopolitical issues uh, globally, uh, not just facing the U.S., um, but if we if we really kind of look at you know where China is, where the U.S. is, and if we look at the U.S. as once being um, a a one of the largest creditor nations to you know historically um, you know one of the largest debtor nations, uh, if not probably the the largest debtor nation in in history. I'm saying it like that because I don't know for sure, but I would you know venture to say that that's probably a true statement. Um, how do you see the impact with with China and and the U.S. and the geopolitical issues that are facing the U.S. right now? Well, first of all, the U.S. is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. I don't say that happily. You know, I'm an American uh, like like your, all of your viewers. So, no, it's not got not good news. It's a good time to be an old American because I don't have to pay the debts. But my children, it's not a good time to be a young American for anybody because there are going to be huge problems down the road, whether we like it or not. Washington denies that. But Washington, you know, they're not very confident how we wouldn't have gotten into this situation of being the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Somewhere along the line, we're going to have big problems. A hundred years ago, Britain was the number one country in the world. There was no number two. But 50 years later, had Britain went bankrupt. Literally, the IMF had to bail them out in 1976. So that was not it. That's not good news. It can happen. It's happened in many countries in the world. And I mean, look at the numbers. This is addition and subtraction. I can see what's happening. I don't like what's happening, uh, but it's going to happen. The U.S. is going to have serious problems down the road. It's not good. Good time to be a young American. I don't like saying that happily, but I have to face facts. And I'm trying to prepare my children for the 21st century. Who knows if I'm doing it right? But if they work in a Chinese restaurant, at least they'll be the maitre d' and not the dishwasher. <laughs> well, you know what? Great analogy. And, and you're right. I mean, D.C., you know, everyone keeps talking about, you know, we, we have a revenue problem here in the U.S. as far as tax basis. I mean, it's it's down about 10 percent, um, you know, just since the um, the Bidenomics has really kicked in. 
And, you know, other people say that the big issue is we have a spending problem. And, and I don't disagree with both of those. Those, those are both issues. But I think the real issue is, is that we have a, a leadership problem. You know, it's, it's a void. Everyone, and this isn't a political thing, Republican or Democrat, because I think it's all the way across the board. Um, so if we look at it this way and we look at empires all the way back to even, you know, before the Roman Empire, the rise and fall, China is a little unique. If historically they they've been at the top, they've come down to the bottom several times throughout history. You know, do you uh, where do you see the U.S. falling uh, as as far as historically? Do you think that we can rebound? Do you think we've already hit the tipping point, the past and no return, or where where do you see the U.S. Well, first back to China. China is the only country in world history that has been on top three or four times. Rome was great once. Britain right. was great once. Egypt was great once. But China's been on top three or four times. They've collapsed. They've had catastrophe three or four times. But they're the only country that after being on the bottom for a few decades or centuries, turns around and rises to the top again. So to us, to the U.S., I hope we, it doesn't happen to us, but I, I can read history. I know that countries that get themselves in deep debt problems have always had big problems. Most of them have never recovered. So I know it's going to happen in the US. I don't like saying any of this, but I can read and I know what has always happened and human beings are human beings. So it, it's going to happen. The US is not going to be the number one country forever. Most countries last 100, 150 years. You can add, we've been on top for 100, 150 years. And mm -hmm. I don't like saying it, but I don't see anything happening in Washington that's going to change what is going on. So from, a, you know, a macroeconomic perspective, you know, everyone keeps talking about the stock market. Um, you know, when when you look at where we're at right now, um, you know, with as being the largest, you know, debtor nation in, in the history of the world, um, and you look at the inflation, you know, globally that we're seeing, but especially here in both, you know, monetary and fiscal policies, what, from a, a market standpoint, what are you, what are you concerned about? Are, are you, and what are you doing from, you know, as, as an investor to, to protect yourself and, and hedge your bets? Well, the U.S. has had a stock market for 230 or 40 years. I presume we will, I hope we will always have a stock market, but there have been very many times when we've had bad stock markets, bad bond markets, bad every kind of markets. I presume that's going to happen again. The U.S. has had the longest period since 2007 in our history where we've had a, a, a period without a, an economic problem or a stock market problem. So time was, it's coming to an end. We're going to need, we're going to have a problem again, at least we always have. And as I say, this is the longest period in American history without a big stock market problem. So it's coming. I can see things happening. Debt is going higher. Inflation is going higher. Interest rates are going higher. All this has happened before. I'm not making any of this up. And it's always ended badly when it's happened, not just in the U.S. and every country in the world. So I can I can look out the window and I can see what's happening. We're going to have a bear market again, probably next year. And when we do, it's going to be the worst in my lifetime because the debt is the worst in my lifetime. We had a problem in 2008 because of too much debt. Ed, look out the window. The debt is the worst in American history the worst in world history. The next time we have a problem, it's going to be very serious. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I, I've got the, the debt clock on over here and I'm looking at it and it's, and it's staggering. You know, at, at this pace, if things don't change and I, I don't see how they're going to be able to affect change to the degree that we need, you know, we're going to be approaching 40 trillion before the next election. Um, so, you know, are you concerned about the U.S. dollar? I, you know, even um, you know, with with the the proxy wars that the U.S. is facing right now, the the dollar has actually gone up a little bit and, and been steady. Um, and are you looking at that as because it's really the the only safe world currency um, to to invest in right now? 
Um, or and, and if not, or what other options are there? Well, first you said 40 trillion. That's the ba on balance sheet. We have a lot of off balance sheet debt in the US, things like social security obligations, which they don't count when they tell you the debt. Many of the maritime obligations, they don't count. So uh, the real US debt is over 100, over 200 trillion US dollars. Again, I don't say this happily, but I have to deal in facts instead of magic. Uh, and as far as the US dollar, US dollar has been the world's reserve currency, the world's mean of exchange for several decades now. But no country has no currencies lasted more than 100, 150 years. I don't like saying it, Ed, but I can see the end coming for the US dollar as the number one currency. And by the way, I don't know what's coming next. If you, you know, please don't say it out loud. Send me an email. I, but I have not been able to figure out yet what is going to compete with or what replace the U.S. dollar. And Washington is making it worse. You know, the world's medium of exchange is supposed to be neutral. Anybody can use it for anything. But Washington is slapping people around now. And if Washington gets angry at you, they cut you off. They say, OK, you cannot use U.S. dollars anymore. But that's not the way the world's international medium of exchange is supposed to work. Now, I'm not the only one that sees what's happening. Even our friends are saying, wait a minute, they could do that to us too. So everybody is now frantically looking for something to compete with the US dollar. Uh, they all see what's happening. I'm not the only one, as I say. And so somebody, something is going to come up to compete with a dollar and eventually replace the US dollar. I don't know when, but I know it's gonna be in your lifetime and mine. So do you think uh, BRICS or BRICSA, you know, with the powers that be, whatever name they wanna to, to come up with, do you, do you think that uh, that's a possibility uh, that, that they take over as as the, the, the world currency? I know anything is a possibility. Usually, I mean, for, you look at back into 100 years ago, very few people thought it could be the US dollar in the 1920s when Britain was number one. As people looked around the world, they didn't think the US dollar had a chance. You know, in the 19th century, the US was a joke. People in Europe thought this was an outlaw nation. And, and we did bankrupt a lot of people in Europe. With our, our policies. So anything can happen. No, very few people in 1890 would have said the US dollar is going to be the replacement for, the, for sterling, but it was. I don't know yet. I am looking. The obvious choice should be the Chinese currency, but the Chinese currency is not convertible. You cannot have an international medium of exchange if it's not convertible. So unless something changes dramatically and quickly in China, it cannot be the renminbi, not for a while yet. And I don't see anything else. I do know the US dollar is on a downward trend. It's not going to continue much longer. When I say, I mean, you know, 10 years from now, we won't be having this discussion. The world will have figured out what is next, but it's coming. I, I've read enough history to know what's happening. One of the problems, well, the problem of history, it is that most people do not learn the lessons of history. And so they can see it staring them in the face, but they will say, oh, don't worry. Don't worry. It's not going to happen. Yeah, yes, it, it is going to happen. And, it's and it will. And history continues to repeat itself over and over and over again. Um, and uh, it, it looks like we have not learned from those lessons. Um, and, and these are the things that, you know, we, we've continued to talk about, you know, here, you know, with our clients for, for years, um, you know, so what are your thoughts on crypto? Because everyone's looking at that as, you know, because it's decentralized, um, and it's unregulated, um, but it also is, a, is a fiat currency. Um, I, what, what do you have any thoughts on cryptos? Well, yes, I. I, I can read the newspaper just like you. I know what has happened and is happening. But, and well, first of all, every country in the world is working on computer money now. Very few have 
used, used it extensively. China is way ahead of the U.S. In China, you cannot take a taxi with currency. You have to have your computer money in China to, do, to buy an ice cream. You have to have your computer money. Others are working on it, including the U.S., we're not there yet. The Chinese are ahead of us, but we'll get there. Everybody will get there. But Ed, when the U.S. government says, okay, this is money now. This is your money. But the U.S. is not going to say, okay, this is the money now. But if you want to use that money over there, you can use their money. You don't have to use our money. That's not the way governments work. Governments like to have control, monopoly. They, they love computer money because they'll know everything you do. They'll call you up one day and say, hey, you've been having too much coffee this month. They'll know everything you do, which they love. I hate it, but they love it. Yeah. So the, the saying, right, power begets power, absolute power begets absolute power. And, you know, when we go to that digital currency, it is it's it's ultimate control. I mean, we, we saw that in China um, and we actually even recently um, saw it uh, in, in Canada. Um, you know, when the, when the government stepped in and, and actually controlled bank accounts. Um, so, you know, and, and I think that that's when we look at the digital currency, this is the fear that you have and I have. Um, and, you know, it, and that's why I think people are looking at cryptos decentralized. But I think, again, the governments, they're going to be able to with regulations and everything else to a certain degree quash that and say yeah we're, that's not accepted we're not going to that's not an, a, an accepted means of of payment or, or currency you either have to use the digital dollar dollar or the digital one or whatever it is to to be able to to have those trades um and i i agree with you i think that's going to be sooner rather than later well um, the US government is not going to say okay ed if you want to pay your taxes with crypto or with computer money, you can. No, that's not the way any government thinks, but most governments don't think that way. They're going to say you have to pay your taxes or your fees or whatever with government money, with our money. And it's not going to be somebody else's money. Absolutely. All right. So from an investment standpoint with, you know, the things that we've already talked about, I mean, what, uh, are are you more inclined to you know in are are you out of the market are you, are you worried because we're we're seeing the the bear market coming, um and you know are you looking more towards commodities gold, um you know mining stocks um you know value companies what is it that that you're really um hedging your bets with or or you know are you just keeping everything in in cash for like lack, lack of a better term. I still own some shares. I mean, I have stocks that I've owned for years, and I'm sure, I, I hope, I'm smart enough to get rid of all of them eventually. Then we have the question, okay, what do you do now? You know, where are you going to put your money? And you just asked the same question. Uh, I suspect at the moment, most of it is in U.S. dollars, because just like you and me, we don't know where else to go. Uh, most people are not going to rush off and put their money into Japanese yen or euros or something else. I'm not anyway. So I don't know where to put my money. But at the moment, much of it is in cash in U.S. dollars. All right, Jim, um, any any uh, other closing thoughts or, or uh, words of wisdom? Um, because I, I, yeah. I think we're we're heading down a path right now, and and I think you've done a very good job summing it all up. Well, Ed, I'm looking every day. I know I have to put my money somewhere. Uh, I'm not keen to have it in U.S. dollars for the reasons we said, but I have not found something else yet. I do own some silver. I do own some gold. I do own some commodities. Commodities are still the cheapest asset class. Real estate in many countries is a bubble. Bonds went up to be the highest in, America, in world history. So bonds are certainly not a good place to put money. Stocks in many countries are near all-time highs. So as I look around, I don't see anything cheap except commodities. I mean, silver is down 60% from its all-time high. Sugar is down 60 or 70% from its all-time high. Those are not bubble kind of numbers. But I don't see any commodities yet that are compelling enough for me to put a lot of money there. I, if I were putting more money anywhere, 
Today, it would be in commodities. I hope the right commodities, but I don't see anything else that maybe you know. Maybe everybody should watch your show to find out where to put their money, but I don't know yet. Well, Jim, thank you so much for, for joining us on the podcast. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your insights and uh, um, thank you for uh, staying up uh, in the middle of the night to, uh, uh, to do the podcast. I appreciate it. I hope we all figure it out because there are going to be some very difficult times ahead. And I hope, I hope I survive. I hope we all survive. Amen to that. So thank you very much and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you again, I hope. Absolutely. Bye -bye. Looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to The Retirement Trainer with your host, Ed Siddell. For our latest retirement news and financial tips, please visit egsifinancial.com or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We look forward to having you back for our, our next episode where we will continue to explore the world of retirement. Until then, please remember to click like and subscribe. See you next episode.